Worship is an experience, amen? When you worship God, it's an experience that we have. And, and when we do that and we lift up the Lord, God is going to have his way. Now this morning, I have a word from the Lord for you. And I'm going to be speaking on keeping the faith. Keeping the faith. Not just having faith, but also keeping the faith. Faith is something that is given to us to grow upon. Amen. And to always count on and, and keep active in our lives. That's why it's so important to make sure that we do feed our faith. Jude writes to the church in Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter there. And he tells the church that we are to contend for the faith. And that word contend means to fight. We are to fight for our faith. How many know what I'm talking about? Amen. You got to fight for for your faith, amen? Because faith is something that is priceless. And we know that faith has a lot of enemies. So, so we need to fight for it. We need to fight for, for what it stands for. We need to fight for the gospel, amen? The preaching of the gospel, amen? As we preach it around the world, we ought to fight for the promises of God's word, the miraculous, the blessings, the grace, the mercy. We can go on and on, amen? Because that's what our faith in God represents and it's worth fighting for. See, if you just sit down there, you know, and do nothing about keeping your faith active, your faith will eventually dwindle and it will, it will just lay low and sometimes it just coasts and, and there's no activity there. But God blesses those that keep faith alive. I want to... I read something to you this morning. We're going to go to the Old Testament, and we're going to be talking here somewhat about uh, Caleb in the Bible. You know, two great names in the Bible, two, two great heroes of faith, Joshua and Caleb. In Joshua chapter 14, verse 6 uh, through verse 9, here's what the word of the Lord says. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenesite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly follow the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. You see, that was Caleb's testimony. It was a testimony of faithfulness, of consistency, that he kept the faith and he kept it alive. And now it was time to receive the reward. It was time to receive the inheritance, the heritage of the Lord. Because God had promised uh, Caleb that this would happen. Just like uh, God's word is a promise to us. The whole uh, Bible is a promise to us as God's people. And it's filled with great rewards and great consequences of blessing. Uh, of faithfulness, uh, where uh, inspiration of strength and power and grace. Uh, and, and those promises do come to us when we walk within the word of God, when we walk within those promises. This is what Caleb was doing his whole life. His whole life was about serving the Lord and what God had promised him. You know, there's nothing like receiving a reward. Uh, for the time or, or the work uh, that we sometimes put in certain things, if we achieve things, amen. Uh, I know Carmen and I in our lifetime, we have seen the heritage of God. We have seen the blessing of God in so many different ways. I can still remember uh, when we were invited to uh, the celebration of the awards for 
the Christian entertainment movies. And we got really excited because uh, we found out that Victor, my movie, had been awarded or had been chosen for five awards. And we were so excited about this that, you know, our movie made it to that point. And here's what the headlines read. Victor wins uh, three gold and one silver crown awards, including best drama. And then it goes on to say, an inspiring true story of the resur restoration of a drug-addicted gang leader also earns gold crown awards for youth film and evangelistic film as well as the silver crown for best picture. i tell you what, you can praise God, amen, because... This is all about the kingdom, amen. I know that there's a Hollywood and there's the, the awards and not about movies and all that, but this is the best award you can ever get, amen, because it's all about eternity. It's all about the kingdom of God, amen. And how many know that when you sanctify some and you surrender it to God, God's going to bless it and he's going to prosper it. And we got so excited. Our family, Carmen and I, got excited. Rosalinda got all excited because she was really behind the whole project. And uh, Greg Wilk Wilkerson, uh, the producer of the movie. But it blessed us tremendously because we realized that we had put so much work into this thing. We had put so much effort. I mean, from the producers who put all his money into this, you know, and all of this was being done by faith. It was all trusting God because we wanted, I, I, I remember the producer and the director coming to me and say, you, you know, what do you want to see out of this movie? I said, I want to see people get saved. Amen. I want to see people come to Jesus. Amen. And, and so he said, this is what we want. And it's going to be a missionary project to the glory of God. And today we can rejoice because as a result of that project, we have seen the reward. And let me tell you, the greatest reward that you can ever get in your life now is to know that people's lives have been transformed. People's lives have been changed because of your effort. Can you imagine how Caleb must have felt when the time came, when the moment came for him to stand before Joshua who was giving out uh, the rewards to the 12 tribes of Israel because of their conquering of Canaan land. The price they paid, the sweat, the blood, the sacrifice that they paid. Caleb's dedication, Joshua's dedication, and now he stands before the man of God and he says, it's time to collect. Well, I want you to know that God keeps his promises. And when God promises something, he brings it to pass. His whole word, the whole Bible is a promise to us. It's, it's a plan that comes from God to every one of us, amen, to fulfill his will in our lives and to take us from, from point A to point Z and, and to bring us through this life and, and also to bring those rewards and those moments in our lives that mean, mean a tremendous, uh, tremendous satisfaction. Notice what Joshua 14, 9 says. So Moses swore on that day, saying, surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. So you see, the Bible tells us that when Moses sent uh, the 12 men into Canaan land to spy, all the 12 spies had a report. Every one of them came back uh, with a, uh, an observation and a report, a story to tell, uh, you know, about what they saw. But also Joshua and Caleb had a report, only that their report was different. Now, it's interesting that, you know, 12 people can walk into a place uh, and they're all looking at the same thing, but two see something different. Two see something different. And the reason why the two are seeing something different is because uh, the other ten are looking through the eyes of the flesh. 
They're looking through the eyes of their carnal man and, 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 and their carnal vision and their carnal thinking. But Joshua and Caleb are looking through the eyes of faith. And it's at this moment when everything that's in their heart surfaces to the top. Caleb was only 40 years old when he started to follow Moses and, and served together with Joshua. And the Bible teaches us that Caleb was faithful all his years. Where now, when he is going to get his reward, he is 80 years of age. And we learn that he was really about 85 years of age, close to 90. But when he receives here the promise, uh, he's 40 years old. And he serves God all those years. He is faithful to God. He is committed to the calling in his life. Joshua 14, 13, and Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. So you see, Caleb received his, his promise, his reward, because he kept his faith. Keeping the faith is the most important task that you have to play today as a Christian in the world that we live in. If there's something that you need to contend for, if there's something the faith that the church must stand up for today is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your faith is everything. Your faith in God is everything. Your faith in God is your strength. Your faith in God is the assurance, amen, that God is going to be with you every single day of your life. And what he has started, he will also finish. That's why we need to fight for our faith. Paul calls on Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 12, and he says, fight the good fight of faith. Notice the good fight of faith. Not just a, a, a fight. Not just, but fight the good fight. If you're going to fight, fight good. If you're going to be a Christian today, be a good Christian. If you're going to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Not just a soldier, but be a good soldier. Amen. Just don't fight the, your, 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 for your faith, but have a good fight. In other words, give everything that you can to it. Notice, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Let me give you three things here about keeping the faith. First, we find that Caleb followed the Lord with all his heart. He followed the Lord with all his heart. He followed God with all his heart. In other words, he put his whole heart into his calling. He knew his calling. He knew the reason why he was there. He knew his purpose. He had a vision. And he understood what that vision was all about. And you know, all of us here also have a calling because the calling of Caleb is, is not an exception. It's not separate. It's the same calling that we all have, the same calling that Moses had, the same calling uh, that Joshua had, the same calling that Caleb had, same calling that Paul had, the same calling that the church had, the, first, the same calling that all the first 12 disciples had, the apostles and down throughout the history of the church. It's the same calling. We're all called to serve God and live for God with all our hearts. Not just half-hearted, but all our hearts. And this is what I believe God is looking for today in our lives. If you look at verse 14, it says, Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenesite, to this day, because he wholly, I want you to see that, he wholly, Hard, he wholly, full-heartedly follow the Lord God of Israel. So you see, you can't say that you are wholeheartedly into something unless you are totally wholeheartedly into that something. If when you believe in something and you say, I am wholeheartedly sold on this, 
then you, your heart has to be sold on it 100%. Or else it will not be your whole heartily thing that is taking place in your life. You know, the Bible doesn't uh, say, it doesn't go into details about Caleb's life or his lifestyle. But I can assure you that Caleb, like Joshua, knew that they were called to make a mark in life. One thing they knew was they were here to make a mark in life. Moses made a mark, but Joshua was to make a mark, and also Caleb, and every other man, every other man, just like every one of us here, just like all, uh, every, every one of us at this morning, we're all called to make a life, in, to make a mark in life. Whether it's in the little things or the big things, you're going to make a mark. You're going to make a mark. You, you may make a mark on the wrong thing. But the Bible calls us, the word of God calls us to make a mark on those things that are, that are from God. Those things that will bring glory and honor. See, that's what your, your relationship with the Lord is all about. What's the most important thing in your life is that you, as you walk with God and as you confess Jesus Christ in this world, you are leaving a mark behind. And you are making a statement with your life to others. And others are looking just like in, in the days of Caleb. Now the Bible also speaks of others that made a mark in their life. Sometimes some that didn't think much about themselves. But they had a heart for God. The Bible speaks of Gideon. Who saw himself as a nobody. But when he surrendered to the will of God. He became a great somebody. And he became a great man of God to the point that God used him to bring deliverance, to bring blessing to his entire family. And not only his personal family, because you see, that's where your testimony really begins. It begins at home. It begins with your loved ones. It begins with, with, with your family. And he made an impact upon his family. He left the mark behind a great testimony to be a great deliverer to the glory of God. Here's another one. Two people that we hardly hear about, Amram and Jacobet, who are, who are really the most uh, famous Bible husband and wife that nobody has heard of. Because when do we hear a sermon on these two people? But then again, everyone has heard of three other people that were given birth by these two people. Moses, Aaron, and Naomi. Who impacted all of Israel. Even to the point that we are impacted today because of these two unheard people. But you see, when you love God wholeheartedly, no matter what, wherever you stand, if you are for God 100%, somehow that's going to come out. Somehow you're going to be a blessing and you will cause a mark. You will leave a mark in life. The Bible speaks of Joseph who was known as a dreamer. A young boy born into uh, one of the most competitive family in the Bible. Uh, a great dynasty. And, and they only saw him as a dreamer. His brother saw him as a dreamer. And as a young man, he is cast into a hole to die. And then he is captured by the Egyptians. He is taken in uh, as a slave. And yet the Bible tells us that what the enemy meant for evil, God turns it into good. And Joseph becomes then a great deliverer, a great prince. Hebrews 11, 7 says, By faith, nor being divinely warned of things not yet seen, move with godly fear, prepare an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. You know, I also think about people today. I remember a young man and his wife who Carmen and I met years ago during the hippie world, a young man by the name of Jay Calhoun. And Jay, if you're listening, I hope you are. I remember when I first met Jay and my, they, they were, and they know they were as hippified as can be. But they were on fire for God. These two 
young people. I'm far for God. And we, they came into our family, had great fellowship, and then they started out with us in the ministry. And Jay was a, a builder. He was a, a construct, con, construction worker. He had a small company. I think at the time I met him, he wasn't even incorporated or anything like this. He was just a good carpenter. And he would do projects for us. And they were attending the first church. And I remember the time when we were looking for an architect. We were looking for a builder. We wanted somebody uh, that would help us put this building together. And the building that we designed was going to be 40,000 square feet. Now, 40,000 square feet, it's like this building is 40,000 square feet from, from this side all the way to the end. It's the same size of a football field. And I remember talking to Jay about it, and I said, well, you know what? We don't have to look far because I think you can do this. And he looked at me, and he says, are you kidding me? He said, no way. Look, I, know, I, I can build a small house, and I can do small projects, but to build this building? And if you ever looked at the plans and everything that it involved in the human sense, for him it was impossible. And I remember him saying, no, 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 not me. I said, Jay, God has tagged you. You're going to do it. And he said, okay, let's go for it. And here we are in this house of worship. Can you give God the glory and the praise? See, Jay left the mark. And he left a great mark. It's the same kind of blessing that all of us have, the same privilege, the same opportunity, the same thing with Caleb. Caleb didn't have to go in as a spy. He could have refused to go into the promised land as a spy. But he went in there because he loved God, because he loved God wholeheartedly. He had surrendered to the Lord 100%. When you surrender to God 100%, nothing will stop you back from glorifying God and bringing honor and praise. No matter how difficult the task may be. Listen, church, we have a great task right now in the kind of society that we're living in, in the kind of world that we're living in. We may be looked upon like a little speck but I want you to know that in comparison we may look like a little speck but I want you to know that you and I are the Caleb's of today and God has called you and I to make marks in this world and to stand up in the name of Jesus amen and impact our society impact this world The Bible tells us that after being delivered from bondage in Egypt, the Israelites were led by God to the border of the land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. And God had promised his people that they would inherit this land. And then Moses chose 12 men, one from each tribe, to scout out the land before entering in. And among them was Caleb. And Joshua. The Bible says that the 12th man spied out the land for 40 days and then came back to Moses. They all saw the same thing that one was seeing. Then they reported that, that the land was fruitful, but its inhabitants were frightening because there were the descendants of Anak who was also family to Goliath. And so 10 of the spies come back. They see the same thing, but what they see is an impossibility to go in and possess the land because there are giants in the land. Let me tell you this. You're always going to have giants in your life. You will always have difficulties to confront As a matter of fact, you know, Carmen and I are fighting giants every single day. Every day. I don't think there's 
one day, amen, that we don't face giants because giants are those impossibilities and, and those things that the devil glorifies when, when he takes a little uh, mouse and he turns it into an elephant and he gives you all the reasons why you cannot be a blessing in this world and why you cannot win your family to Jesus and why you can't be healed and why you cannot have a breakthrough in your life. Amen. That's his job. See, that's his part. Amen. But the the other side of the report is uh, that comes just as Joshua and Caleb saw the same thing. Uh, they also saw the possibilities and they saw the power of God at work because their faith was not based on man's feeling, but it was based upon the promise that God had given them. That's where we stand as a church. COVID may be big, and everything that is going on in the world today may be bigger than you and me, but I want you to know that there is one that is greater than in you, and his name is Jesus, and he is alive, and he is well today. The Bible tells us that Caleb was not just a man of God. He was also an outspoken man. You know, it's a good thing to know that you are a man of God and a woman of God, but also to be outspoken. We need some outspoken people today. We need people today that are not afraid or ashamed. Do you know one of the greatest weapons that you have as a Christian is your tongue? Yes. Amen. It's good to have belief. It's good to have faith. But are you speaking your faith? Amen. And are you speaking what you actually believe? Numbers 13 Verse 30 says this, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. So the report was a negative report. They disheartened all the people, but Caleb stands before the people and he speaks out his faith and he says, No, we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. And what may be impossible to you is not possible. It's possible with God. Joshua 14, 8 and 11 says this. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly follow the Lord my God. Moses swore on that day saying, surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God and now behold the Lord has kept me alive and he said these and, and he said these 45 years ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the, in the wilderness and now here I am this day 85 years old as yet as I am strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me but as my strength was then so now is my strength for war both for going out and for coming in I remember one day I was feeling down and, and out and the Spirit of God took me to the scripture. And you know what I did? I took the scripture and I made a bold copy of it and put it on my refrigerator. And every day before leaving the house, I looked at that scripture and I said, I'm better today than yesterday. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm better today. God. God has better things for me today. Surely he has blessed you in the past, but get ready because he's got a better day coming for you. He's got a greater day that is coming for the church. Amen. And praise God. You know, we, 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 we see here how Caleb was not just sold out to God. Caleb knew why God had chosen him. He knew the purpose and the reason. And listen, today God is still... Uh, in the making of Caleb, God is still looking for, for, for a people that are, that are wholeheartedly sold out to Jesus. I can tell you, we as a church didn't get this far simply by fooling around and playing around with our faith. We got this far because there was an army of people, men and women, that was sold out to Jesus 100%. And understood what the vision 
of this work was all about. They understood the vision just like Jay and others. They may have not had a great background. They may not have graduated from the top theological school uh, in the country. But I'll tell you what, they were sold out to Jesus. They were sold out to God. And let me tell you something. That is all you need to, to walk victoriously in the world that we live today. Just sell out to Jesus 100%. And you're going to see how God is going to make ways where there are no ways. Can I get him an amen? So today you may not be a Joshua or a Caleb. But if you are a follower of Jesus and you love God, get ready because God will raise you. To make a mark in this world. Let me move on here and see that keeping the faith is to nourish what you already have. Nourish what you already have. Somebody said grass will always look greener on the other side when you don't water what you already have. I learned that a long time ago being in ministry. That if I was going to see this church grow, I needed to put everything within me into this work. I could not be half-hearted. I had to do it 100%. And that's a principle that applies to every one of us. How much are you putting into your faith? How much are you, are you depositing? How much are you giving? How much time? How much commitment and dedication are you giving to your faith in your walk with the Lord? You know, I'm sure that Caleb, uh, as well as Joshua, were outnumbered and surrounded by many people uh, that were not as dedicated as them. Remember, they were in the wilderness. Remember that they faced all kinds of, of negative circumstances and oppositions. From food to water, from the heat of the day, from sickness, from all kinds of things uh, that were present. All the unbelief, all the criticism that came along with that. You know, it's no different than the church today. The church has a lot of people. But not everybody in the church is totally committed to God. Just because a person says they're Christians, it doesn't mean that they're born again. That their lives have been changed and transformed and they're walking with God and they are experiencing the presence of God. I could almost see Caleb. I could almost see Joshua. Just the two of us. The Bible says that generation didn't make it. And they didn't make it because they didn't have the same spirit that Caleb and Joshua had. They didn't have the same commitment, the same dedication, and they were not feeding their faith. See, it's important that as we go on this journey, that we you feed your faith. And you feed your faith every single day, not just on Sundays when you come here uh, and thank God we come to the house of God, but on your own. Let me tell you the most, most powerful feeding time for your faith is when you are at home by yourself. Or you take time to go somewhere and feed that faith of yours and see it grow. Because the more you feed your faith, the stronger you get. I can remember when we were sitting down with the doctor, Carmen's doctor, one of the doctors, the kidney doctor, you know, and, and it sounded kind of funny because he turns to me suddenly, he says, I want her to be fat. I said, that's a no-no word, fat. And I, I said, what do you mean? He says, I want her nice and fat because the more fat that she has in her body, the more protection she's going to have. Now, in today's world, it doesn't make sense, right? Because fat is a dirty word. Everybody wants to be skinny and thin. You know, but being skinny and thin is not necessarily saying that you are healthy. Amen? Because really what matters is how you're made up on the inside. And fat is important in our faith. See, God likes fat faith. Amen. 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 That's one time we can say praise God for fat. <laughs> because God likes fat faith. Strong faith. Second Peter 1, 
Verses 5 and 9 says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. I teach on this often. I love it. It is so real because we're talking about real time here. He goes on to say, To virtue, which is power, knowledge. Knowledge. And by the way, I looked up that word virtue in the Greek. And it connects it to the same virtue that came out of Jesus' body when the woman uh, with the issue of blood touched Jesus. And the Bible says that virtue came out of him. Power came out of him. And you see, God wants you to have a faith that it's not just religious faith, but faith that is filled with the Holy Spirit, with the power of God, with the supernatural, so that when you use your faith, amen, it causes an impact. And Peter says, feed your faith power. And then to that power, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love, for if these things are yours and abound, you will neither, you will neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. You see, faith is built when we feed it and when we feed it with the right Food, Because not only does it make you stronger in the power, because faith is the door that draws. Faith is the magnet that's going to draw the power of God in your life. And it's also going to interpret the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the word. And that is why Peter says, if you don't have this kind of faith, then what happens is you will not be able to discern what is happening around you. Because you are short-sighted. That's why we get a lot of short-sighted Christians today. When, when you go into a conversation with, with some of the Christians today, you know, they're, 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 they're shallow. They, they can only, only retain certain level of information or knowledge or experience. And that's because they're short-sighted. And their eyes are not open completely to what God is doing and what God has actually prepared for all of us that love the Lord when we are strong in our faith. Colossians 1, 9, 14 says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Notice, to, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthen with all might. There goes that word again. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualify us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And, and you know, and, and when I see the word joy here, I was thinking, you know that joy has left this world. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. Joy is leaving America. Yeah. If you just look around at everything that is happening, I find no joy in some of the stuff that is happening. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because if there's one thing that the word of God will bring in in every situation, and that is why today more than ever the churches must preach the gospel. We must preach the cross. We must preach the blood of Jesus. We must preach the baptism in the Holy Spirit with power. Amen. We must preach the miracles. Amen. Because that's what brings joy to a people that are dying. And that's why here the apostle is praying that our faith becomes this kind of faith. Strong faith. Fed. Amen. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. 
Let me give you three quick things here, ways that we can increase our faith. Feed our faith. Feed our faith. We've been talking about some of these, and one of them is prayer. Prayer. Prayer will feed your faith. Even if you're asking God for something, you need faith. You need faith. And faith has to be involved in prayer. Jesus always connected faith to prayer. He said, when you, when, when you pray, have what? Faith. And prayer increases our faith. Because as we ask God for things, uh, we can witness how God has answered those things. Have you ever counted your blessings? Have you ever seen how God, how many of you have had things answered in your life because you prayed for them? And God answered them. God answered them. And, and, and sometimes precisely to the point. Carmen and I used to, when, when we were traveling, we knew of, of a sister who, who, who was friends to my mother. My mother has sisters that when they got saved, they got on fire for God, they were prayer warriors, all of them. And there was one who knew this other lady by the name of Maria. She was not family, but Maria was a prayer warrior. And, and Maria was such a powerful prayer warrior. She lived in Puerto Rico, and she lived in the mountains of Puerto Rico. And she was an elderly lady. She, she walked like this. She had long hair. She walked like this. And Carmen and I would just fly purposely to Puerto Rico just to go and pray with her. You ever met somebody like that? You just want to hang out with them? Amen. You just want to be with them? And we would fly out there just, just and we would go up that mountain, you know, and, and, and go up there and pray with Sister Maria. She was so full of the Holy Spirit that after prayer, we would walk out there. And it was not just prayer. It was prophetic praying. Something, that, a gift that Carmen has, prophetic praying. You know, when people pray for you and they tell you life, hello, and they tell you life in prayer and you walk out of there and you say, how do they know that? The Holy Spirit, amen. And many times our faith would just grow tremendously. It was all because of prayer. And it's okay to pray for small things. It's okay because as you pray for the little things and the small things, uh, God will increase your faith. And God will show you all things, marvelous things and insights uh, that you never knew were happening in your life. And they are happening through the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 6, 18 says, praying always with all prayer. Notice that with all prayer, all kinds of prayer. And supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. All kinds of prayer. Have you ever prayed singing? Sing a song unto the Lord. Amen. Just sing. Sing anything unto God and glorify his name. Amen. Another thing we can do to feed our faith is to practice what we read. Amen. You know, a lot of us love to jot things down. I see you. Unless you're on your phone texting and reading somebody else's text. And there's people that come to church, and I really don't know why they come. They sit there, and all they do is texting and looking at pictures. And all. But here's the problem with that. Here's the problem. When you leave church, that's what you have to stand on. Your last, it's not even a conversation because people don't even call now. Everything is a text. And that's what you're going to live out. You're going to live out what you do all day in writing. Whether it's texting or putting it down on paper or whatever. But if you jot down words from the Bible and words from the promises of God, amen, and you jot them down while you're in church, I promise you that those things are going to manifest themselves in your life because that is the thing and that is the word that God uses in your life. 
That's why Caleb was so determined. No, 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 no. I got to do this. I have to do this. I got to do this because I have a promise from God. Amen. And for 40 years, he walked that promise. He lived that promise facing all kinds of adversity. And his faith kept growing and growing. Third, read the word every day. Every single day you should read something, whether it's a half a chapter or a chapter, even if it's two verses, the word of God is inspired and powerful. Amen. And it will bless you and it will build up your faith. Uh, Psalms 43 says, he has put a new song in my mouth. Amen. Amen. You know, talking about singing in the word of God, you know, we sing the word of God. We can sing the promises of God. Just sing what God is speaking to your heart, what God is telling you. The other day I was in the car and, and you know, and I know I'm facing some mountains in my life. And, and I told God, I said, God, I had to overcome this mountain. I, I just began to sing. I began to sing a scripture and I just started singing this scripture and, and, and I, the more I sang, then I stopped, I hummed it, I whistled it and then suddenly about 20 minutes later, I didn't realize, but something was coming up and suddenly I realized and I discerned that my God, I have peace. I have the peace of God. Amen. Because that's what God will do in your life. When you have the knowledge of the word of God, that's what's going to work in you. It's going to work in your head. It's going to work in your heart. It's going to work in your spirit. Can I get an amen? amen. Well, let me, let, me, let me stop here and conclude with this. We're talking about keeping the faith. It's to know what you want in life. What do you want in life? For Caleb, it was to please the Lord. It was to please God. No doubt about it. He wanted to please God from the very beginning. And he said it and he testified about it since he was 40. He walked with God. He kept the promise. He was faithful. He wanted to do everything that he could to please the Lord. To fulfill the will of God. Just like you know, God had called Moses and God had called Joshua and God had called other, uh, Abraham and others. Caleb had no problem in understanding that this is what I'm here for. I'm, I'm here to please God. So God, whatever you want from me, you want me to be a spy, I'll be a spy. You want me to be a messenger of hope, I'll be a messenger of hope. You want me to teach in church? You want me to serve others? You want me to usher? You, you, you want me to uh, be a prophet? You want me to be an evangelist? Whatever. I'll do your will. And you know, that's what God is looking for today in the church. He's looking for the Caleb's. He's looking for those people that will respond to the calling, to the great calling, to please him, to please God. What did Jesus do? When, when, when Satan came to him and tempted him not to go through with the cross. He looked at it. He looked at his life and he said, yeah, there's a price to pay. But nevertheless, let your will be done in my life. Because that's the most important thing in the life of the believer. Amen. In, in the life of the believer is that you do the will of the Lord, the will of God. And especially if you are trusting God for your future and also for eternal life. Caleb had a reason and a purpose for life. And it was to please God. To do whatever God wanted him to do. But also to possess what was given to him. He knew what the Lord had told him. He knew what God had given him. And therefore he pursued it with all his heart. Philippians 3.12 says this. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected. But I press on. Notice, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. What is it, God, that you, you have placed your hand on my life for? 
See, Paul is not just talking about reaching heaven. We all know we're going to make it to heaven. And you better know. Because you never know when you leave this world. You know, today I'm having that funeral. Thank God he was a believer. Tomorrow I have another funeral. And she was a believer. But what if they were not believers? What is your hope for tomorrow? What is the assurance of your heritage and your insurance? See, Caleb knew what he wanted. He knew that God had promised him something. And so he wanted to reach that promise. Paul knew the same thing. He said, what is it that you have touched me for? What is it that you have called me for? Have you ever asked yourself that? Because let me tell you something. You're here for a reason. You're not here in vain. You're not here just to work and play. You're not here just to hold a job from nine to five. You're not here just to be a husband or to be a wife. You're not here just to be a son or a daughter. You're not here just to be a business person. Amen. You are here with God's divine purpose. Amen. And his intentions is that you leave a good mark. Put your stake down. This is who I am. Amen. He is who I am in the Lord. And Paul writes, and he says this in Philippians 3, verse 13, 14. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Notice that Paul says, I press forward toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, the Olympics are going on right now. And those, some of those people can get awards, but those awards are for here. They're for here. But the awards that God gives, they have eternal value. They're not just made out of gold. They are made out of the best, best goal you can ever find. Amen. The goal that is in heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it starts here right now in your life. It begins right here where you're alive, where you have the opportunity. Amen. You're not going to have any opportunity once you leave. But now, Jude says in 1-3, right? We, I quoted that script, scripture that we are to contend for the faith. In 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all that have loved his appearing. What a glorious hope. A hope that is for today. Amen. A hope that is for tomorrow. A hope that is for the future. Because one day, yes, we're going to get the final entry. One day we will receive that final reward. Amen. And that final reward is that you made it to heaven. And you have inherited the greatest heritage that you can ever have in your life. Amen. But it begins now. It starts today. It begins today. You see, when you... When you stand before the Lord today, amen, are you wholeheartedly for him? Have you sold out to him 100%? You see, you, you, there's no such thing as half a Christian. There's no such thing as, you know, you almost made it, amen. There's no such thing, no. No, you have to be wholeheartedly sold out to Jesus 100% because how many know that when he died for you, he died wholeheartedly so that you can have eternal life. Come on, put your hands together and give him praise and glory, amen.